Three prominent pulmonologists recently convened virtually to discuss building automated programs for the early detection of lung cancer. In this webinar excerpt, Dr. Susan Garwood of HCA Healthcare shares her experiences on the automated follow-up of incidental pulmonary nodules. She's joined by Dr. Michael Pritchett and Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. We'll start with introductions. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Garwood. Um, it's lovely to be with you all tonight. Um, I will be the incoming treasurer next year, so excited to be more on the executive board for SAB. Um, I function as an advanced bronchoscopist. I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the pulmonary director for the, um, the physician director for the pulmonary service line for HCA, which is about 184 hospitals. So that'll give you some, some background on um, why we needed to do what we did. So excited to be here tonight. I'm Michael Pritchett. I'm an advanced bronchoscopist and past president of the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jeffrey Thompson. I'm also very excited to be here. I'm an advanced bronchoscopist and lung cancer specialist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm excited to talk through this. I do think this is really a novel way for us to present this information with Dr. Thompson being in academics, myself being in a large IDN system, meaning a community hospital. We have 184 of those within HCA. So really, the problem has been laid out. And at HCA, we decided that part of what we needed to do was figure out a solution for all the people that fell through the cracks. So the question is, you know, what do we do? So low lung nodule follow-up. So we know about only 30% get the follow-up. So we needed a solution. And this was when I came over to HCA um, in 2015. I spent a lot of time at an institution um, down the street, also a large community-based practice, where we had a really great stage three and stage four um, lung cancer programs. We did a lot of EBIS, which probably most of us did in the early, um, around 2010 to 2015. But what we kept seeing when we had tumor board was that we had imaging in our own institution, a chest X-ray, a CT scan, an abdominal scan, where patients that we diagnosed with advanced stage cancer fell through our cracks, okay? So they came into our home is what I call it, and they left our home with cancer without us telling them. And we decided we wanted to develop software. So we looked at a lot of other um, commercially available products and decided that we just didn't think we had the right fit. So we decided to build our own um, software platform to flag CT scans for lung nodules. That platform is called Patient ID. The whole issue with lung cancer is if we can find lung cancer smaller than a centimeter, that five-year survival could be over 90%. So we decided that we really wanted the pulmonologist to take the lead. Um, we actually have some thoracic surgeons who take the lead on some of these um, nodule programs, but our lead is six millimeters or greater um, on a CT report. And we started in the emergency room. We felt that those were our highest risk patients, often lacked good connectivity to primary care, often had more comorbidities, often had less um, health um, you know, information. And so um, we started there and then we moved to our inpatient unit and then our outpatient unit. And we also wanted to check to see if the patient was eligible. So say the patient already had a known cancer diagnosis, that patient would not be eligible who would forward them to their oncologist, say they were already connected with the pulmonologist who was aware of the nodule or maybe not even aware, we would also refer them back to their primary pulmonologist. They may be a hospice patient or out of state or have an insurance barrier. So we navigated those that we consider to be eligible based on those criteria. Now we had some um, strong software language in there. So as if the nodule was calcified, we threw it out. If it was not pulmonary in nature, sometimes our CT scans will note thyroid nodules or kidney nodules. So it had negating factors to make sure we were highly specific in the information that we um, procured from our automated imaging. Now, we also felt like we needed to overread our screening CT scan. So we do know that an LRAD 3 or a 4, 3 being um, likely benign but can't be sure, um, and a 4 being suspicious, we wanted to make sure that our primary care physicians and others knew that they had a pathway with a lung nodule clinic and a screening clinic to get assistance. And so we actually um, moved those through our nodule pathway after our automated software. 
So after our software actually went into play, we realized we needed to hand these nozzles to somebody who had the clinical acumen in order to search through the medical record and give us more information. So we actually hired navigators to manage the output from this patient navigation program. Now, this is different than a cancer navigator, which some of you may have. And this is really what we want you to take away. So that the types of individuals we hired to be our nodule coordinator really were able to care for patients throughout the whole care continuum. They would assist patients, clinicians, stakeholders in collection, uh, reporting, and the presentation of the program outcome. Um, so our qualifications, you could be um, an, an RN, um, you could be a radiology register, you could have my current nodule coordinator worked in radiation oncology, so really two or more years of clinical healthcare related experience. And we obviously would prefer somebody with radiology, pulmonary or oncology experience. And that's what most of ours are throughout the HCA system. And if you think about the number of nodules that they're seeing right now, our productivity per nodule coordinator is 1200 nodules managed yearly. And that includes workup and navigation. So this looks like a complicated slide, but again, we want to um, understand the care pathway. So the first thing is that once the um, patient is documented as having a nodule, we first want to interact with their primary care physician. So we don't want to overstep our bounds here. So the first is to check with the primary care physician. If they don't have a primary care physician, then we contact the patient directly. Once we get permission, quote unquote, to navigate the patient, we wanna make sure that the pulmonologist has a seamless plan at the time of that clinic visit. So we wanna make sure that we're prepared to take action. And if you're prepared to take action on a nodule, you have to think about risk stratification. Would that look like a blood test to help you risk stratify? Would it look like a PET scan to help you risk stratify? You may need dedicated imaging of the chest if it was only an abdominal film. I think if you're thinking about going to bronchoscopy, then I want to know what their lung function is so that I can think about, even before a diagnosis is made, if that patient could be a surgical candidate or if they may be a candidate for SBRT. So within HCA, so at the time of the clinic visit, I'm able to make a clinical assessment of risk. I'm able to schedule them on the same day for tissue sampling, whether that be EBIS or a navigational bronchoscopy, whether um, that be a um, peripheral navigation or robotic. And sometimes it means that I call in my surgeon partner, um, like I did today, um, as we had a small, very peripheral subpleural nodule with negative nodes. So I'm going to EBIS the patient and then the surgeon will do a wedge biopsy um, if needed. So we want to have an all-in-one clinic visit. I want to be thinking already about the amount of tissue that I'm obtaining to make sure I get enough for molecular testing, even in the early stage. Um, again, that's very important. And now let's say that patient came back negative for cancer. So if they had a definitive negative diagnosis like sarcoid or histo, we would close that patient out and hand them on to the appropriate treating physician. Or if they were non-diagnostic, we needed a clear delineation of what that follow-up was going to be. Often that may be culture follow-up at the six-week mark or a repeat CT scan at three or six weeks, three or six months. All of those things have a human attached to them that is not myself. So thank God I have some helpers. So what does this look like? And I think this is the most important thing. Um, I, I think one of the statistics we often hear in our current environment 95% of our cancers are found in the incidental space, 95%. So if you don't have an automated program helping you come through your electronic medical record and your imaging, you need one because only 5% of our cancers are being found in CT lung screening. Now we're gonna talk about that in the future, but if you're talking about the value proposition to adding automation, to this process, this is what it looks like. So within HCA, like I said, we have 184 hospitals. In order to get the nodule program, we had to make sure that you had the appropriate receivers, meaning that you had an advanced bronchoscopist or an IP physician who could do the biopsy or a thoracic surgeon who would take that role. You needed to have access to radiation oncology, medical oncology, and um, a surgical program. You had to have an MDM um, program, um, so multidisciplinary management. The conference had to be in place, and you had to have both a coordinator and a nurse navigator. So we turned these things on slowly from 2017 
um, to 19. So we did some testing over that time frame to make sure that the plan would work well. And then beginning in uh, 2019 uh, to 2021, we began rolling out these programs. So this is what 100 facilities looks like within HCA. So our total CT scans, 1.4 million. Okay, so that had um, a field of view of the lung. So that could be an extremity CT scan. That could be a head and neck CT scan. That could be any imaging of the chest. It could be any imaging of the abdomen that including those lower fields. So lots of scan opportunities. And there are some programs, um, automated programs that only include the chest themselves. We wanted to look everywhere. Everywhere there was opportunity to see the lung. And if it was greater than six millimeters, then we wanted to look at it. So of those 1.4 million, 20,000 of them had a nodule that was greater than six millimeters that were eligible for the program. We talked about eligibility earlier. So percentage of eligible patients who were navigated, meaning that they accepted navigation, 63%. Now, I would love for that to be 100%, but some people live out of state. Some people just declined, um, and we use those declining primary care patients as education opportunities. So the percentage of navigated patients who have procedures, this is where your ears should peak up because we are not trying to drive all these patients to procedures. We're trying to drive the appropriate patient to procedures with risk stratification, with guardrails in place on what good patient management looks like. So with those things in mind, we had 25% of the patients with incidental nodules that were eligible for navigation, had a procedure, and of those, we had 1,400 cancers. So that's about 9 to 12%, depending on what part of the country you were in. Um, here in Nashville, um, we were at 11% of our incidental patients had cancer. So I think you got to do a lot of legwork on screening to find lung cancer, which is fine, because when you find lung cancer on screening, 70% of the time or greater, it's going to be early stage disease. So screening is very important, but look at our numbers. And we did a pathetic job, just like everybody else in the country is doing. Screening has a lot of obstacles. I think so of our screening population, we screened um, within HTA walls. We do have some joint ventures that aren't on here, um, just 12,000 people. And we found 62 cancers. Now, if you look at 62 compared to 1,400, guess what the split is? 95.5. So I think if you want to know where your proposition is to find lung cancer currently in this present state, it is in this incidental space. So this is actually what it looks like here in the Nashville market. So again, I was part of the, the beta site. So I was um, the second um, 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 second facility rolled out. Um, we also did an awful job with screening. So we screened just over 1,500 patients. Now we're about 2,500 this year. So we are increasing some of that um, guideline changes, but found only five cancers with lung cancer screening. We found 110 again, um, with our uh, nodule management program, about 90,000 CT scans that had a field of view of the lung um, and actually got my percentage wrong. It looks like 13% of our incidentals uh, that were navigated had cancer. So if you look at the value proposition at 2% or 3% with um, screening versus 13%, certainly worthwhile. I think if you're not doing this to figure out a way. So this actually looks like what our performance looks like over time. This is by month. And you can see, again, 2020 is uh, in the bottom, 2021 in the middle, 2022. And again, those are the number of eligible patients. You can imagine uh, the more patients we get into the system. COVID really was a big actually increase for us because of all the chest imaging and all the follow-up. But these are the number of patients who are navigated per month. Um, and if you look at those uh, numbers, the numbers are quite high. So 154, it looks like that we did um, um, in June. But um, I review these every Monday and um, I review them personally with our navigator. Um, and we're usually reviewing anywhere from 25 to 40 um, every week. And so it is a, a labor of love on us. Um, but very effective for us to actually move the patients through the system and to reassure the physicians that we have responsible handling of them, that we're only using our fancy robot or other diagnostics whenever it is essential. And because of that, we're able to find lung cancer. So our program statistics, so on average across HCA, about two and a half percent of our CT scans have a nodule. Greater than 90 percent of them have to have additional imaging. We haven't even spoken about that. So if you want to talk about downstream revenue, New, no matter what they need, an, an interval follow-up the majority of the time. Sometimes I look at them and it's clear that it's been stable, 
um, the radiologist may have missed prior imaging or the imaging may actually show that it's calcified um, or that it's decreased in size. And so not every single person requires follow-up imaging, but 90% of the time they will do. So I think on average, 20% of our patients require a procedure. Anywhere from 9 to 16% of them have a positive cancer diagnosis. And the most important factor that they care about is that we have a 20 to 25% conversion to thoracic surgery. We would love for those numbers to continue to increase. Remember, these could be symptomatic patients or Again, we call this incidental. Sometimes they're found with urosepsis and they have an abdominal image with a CT. But these are a mixture of inpatient, ER patients, and outpatients. And so the stage is going to vary. But again, that surgical conversion um, at 25% is going to catch your administrator's um, uh, catch their administrator's eye. And for those of you, again, this is the SAB. So what does it look like when you really begin to comb your EMR and comb your synapse? So what does it mean if you look for small peripheral nodules? When I began this program, we were in the throes of trying to find incidental nodules through this program. And you can see about 18% of the time um, in 2019, I was doing robotics for peripheral navigation. In 2020, that increased to 37%. In 2021, about 70% of the time, what I'm doing in the Bronx suite um, involves robotic bronchoscopy because I'm searching for small peripheral nodules, which means ideally, if that's where I'm starting, then we have a higher percentage of early stage disease. So it really has changed what I'm doing and very much driven our volume. We're just over a thousand um, robotic bronchoscopies since 2019. Yeah, we'll do. We'll open this up for some discussion uh, amongst the three of us. As as you mentioned before, we're in three different uh, settings here, whether it's academic, a small community, uh, or a big IDN network. Um, so I think a lot of people are asking specifically, what kind of software do you need to detect nodules, um, either in radiology reports or through the actual scans themselves? You mentioned that the existing platforms that were out there weren't cutting it for you, so you had to do it yourself. Is that something that's practical? Is that very common? Uh, and, and what did you look at before you got to that conclusion? That's a great question. What makes the best fit? And also, who is going to pay for it? So I think our biggest issue was it was a big capital outlay um, for some of the commercial products that we didn't know if it was going to fit our individual needs. We also wanted to be able to change the levers. Um, and if we were willing to modify the software, a lot of the time, um, it may cost additional money to do that. We started, and you can, you can start very simply. You can start with your radiology IT and ask them to flag words like Fleischner or nodule um, in order to get started. Again, you still have to have the human to hand that to, uh, to work that. But the software really depends on who's gonna pay for it, how do you get, we didn't have any value proposition at that point, Mike. Yeah, and Jeff, what are you guys doing at a large academic medical center with respect to nodule detection? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like right now we do have the you know capability to um, you know extract in an automated fashion you know, the pulmonary nodule detection, again, it's kind of a, a homegrown, uh, you know, detection software, but the vast majority of our, you know, lung nodule program is really based on, you know, referrals, either self-referrals from patients or, um, or from primary care physicians. Um, and so we're, we're still kind of working out the logistics associated with the downstream implications of detecting and, and managing these patients. So I was going to ask Susan, you know, like when you rolled this out and you're talking about reviewing over a million scans, you know, like how, how did you, you know, adjust the, um, you know, the, the flow of patients to where you could handle that downstream volume initially? I think we realized that there was a lot of discrepancy in the way that the radiologists read the reports. So we had a lot of noise in the beginning. So we're able to fine tune, um, you know, those 1.4 million scans, you know, down to 20,000 scans for all 100 institutions. So you start dividing those up into the ones that were actionable. We were able to really fine tune. So what I would say is start small. So we started with an alpha site, one hospital only. Then we grew that to a few others within that facility. Then we moved to another facility before we began to expand. The problem is going to be the false positives. And do you have a human Right, because if AI works the way that it should, then everything will just be true positive. We know that's not real life. So what we had to do was spend our time really um, changing the levers to make sure we had it as specific as possible to take out the noise. So we just work with our data scientists to 
review these and make sure that we were able to handle the volume. And to handle the volume, I don't just hand this to any program. If you're going to have it, then you have to have the coordinator. You have to have the physician champion. You have to have dedicated clinic time. You have to have dedicated bronchoscopy time. You have to have dedicated presence at multidisciplinary clinic. So this is not for the faint of heart, but if this is your life's work, like it is mine, then yes, I want to do all those things. But I think you have to be able to know that there are multiple, multiple things that go into this, not just a software. And for those people who are wondering, you know, not, not every site will be able to, you know, build this themselves. So I guess you have to ask yourself, you know, do you buy it or do you build it? And and that answer may be different based on your institution. Your IT may not have the bandwidth, pun intended, uh, to do this themselves. Um, so you may need to look at software. And there are plenty of software packages out there. I was going to just, you know, say that, that one of the bullet points on here that I'm sure everyone's thinking to themselves is, how do you get the navigators to be funded? You know, how do you go to the administration and say, you know, initially when you were you know, building this program, how did you make the argument to say, oh, yes, we definitely need navigators to do this? Yeah, and I think that's, again, they wouldn't give us, you know, one to begin with. And so what we did was we borrowed, right? So we borrowed half of an FTE. We borrowed, you know, one quarter of an FTE uh, to do a um, to do an alpha site you know so we did you can run these in the background so before we turn programs on we actually can run the software in the background and go okay how are we going to be able to manage this do we have part of an fte that we can borrow um but basically we we started with an alpha we looked at the downstream revenue from that and realized the downstream revenue will cover itself but you need talks like this which will help if i had one of these it would have helped me um same thing when i got robotic navigation what i did was use my own paper from super dimension the very first year I had, you know, I had a hundred bronchoscopies my first year that were new to the system. You know, early stage disease was very high, 50 plus percent at early stage disease. And so use that same argument when I applied that to robotic bronchoscopy to say that the downstream is worth it. Yeah, I think sometimes we have difficulty convincing administration to do something. You know, it, it's like this, if you build it, they will come kind of thing and they want it. Well, you've got to have them already coming before we'll fund this. And so I think so you really need to have an administration that's open minded and willing to work with you and, and, and trust your assurances, which I'm sure they get from every specialty that wants something. Right. They all give assurances. Uh, just get us this and it'll be the best urology program ever. Uh, so. It, you know, it, it takes some of that trust on their part uh, because what we don't want to get into is exactly what you mentioned. They fund the software, you flip the switch, and now you have way too much work and nobody to do it. Um, and, and so you're exactly right about there's so many different facets that you need. And it goes all the way down to even OR block time or anesthesia time or, you know, because somebody has to biopsy all these things. Um, and so I, that's basically the last point. How many pulmonologists or surgeons do you need to do these procedures? Um, obviously, it depends on, on your, your program and, and how much time you have dedicated to do that. Because if you're reviewing, you know, 40 scans every Monday or 100 scans every Monday, well, then you're probably not doing a lot of procedures then. So then they have to fund another partner to come in or maybe another robot for another site. Uh, mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is built on downstream revenue. Mm -hmm. How have you gotten them to care about downstream revenue? So get them in their gut, um, get them in their heart, and then talk about what it means and how you have a solution. If you go in with the plan and you go in with the solution, you go in downstream at the end, you know, you'll get them. Okay, because they really can't argue with that downstream. But what you want to talk about is early stage diagnosis and increasing the funnel and volume of patients that you get earlier in the system. Yeah. And, and how is your help overall to, to both of you um, it, with your navigators calling PCPs about nodules uh, on a scan that they may have ordered? How is that viewed by your PCPs? Is it welcome help? Is it meddling? Um, what are you running into? <laughs> I think there will be some few. And I would say at this point, probably 2% of our physicians who really opt out. The rest of the time, our software actually picks the physicians and will show me an opt out list. And then we just go and we say, let me, let me just talk you through this. Let me give you some examples. You know, let me share some stories with you, you know, give me one chance. Um, and so now we're at 98% acceptance. Um, and that, that's pretty great. Yeah, I, I would say that's really interesting. You know, I, I would say our primary care physicians seem you know more than willing to kind of relinquish care 
of the pulmonary nodules. And I would say the patients, once they're in a lung nodule program, really appreciate it as well. And I always say a picture's worth a thousand words. You know, the the patients love looking at their scans, seeing the nodules, going over appropriate lung nodule management. And I think there's a lot of reassurance you know, at the, at the patient level, because I have a lot of patients coming in to clinic. They're so anxious, you know, and they have a four millimeter nodule or, or, or something like that. And you can allay a lot of that anxiety, kind of explain, you know, you know, the, their risk of lung cancer, show them the nodule, discuss, you know, optimal, you know, surveillance uh, plan. And I think that they really appreciate that. And then that gets fed back to the primary care physicians. And, and I think they've been very happy you know, to kind of refer patients into a lung nodule program. All right. I think the other thing is just reassuring them for responsible handling. And so I think that the confidence in communicating your decision making is important and the communication of when they have a cancer, that the primary care physician will be involved. What oncologist would you like them to see? Let me tell you what they showed. At, what? Let me tell you about our discussion at MDT. Do you have a surgical preference? Um, so all of those things, as long as they felt like you're re- we're handling them responsibly, responsibly, communicating with them and making them feel like they're part of the plan, um, then I think that's, that's it. This concludes our video. For the complete panel discussion, which includes this video excerpt and more, look for the AZ-sponsored video entitled, Building Automated Programs for Early Detection of Lung Cancer.